Congratulate all you guys for having the good sense to take this course. I've talked to more than a few people who've taken it more than once. Some have surfaced some years later saying, well, I had a business or two, and now I'm ready to go back and cover what I wish I had absorbed from that course. Um, but a quick sampling. How many of you are here because you're thinking of applying for the 100K competition? Okay, a smattering. Well, this will be helpful. How many of you are here because you're thinking that you might want to abandon all these studies you're doing and actually do something in the entrepreneurship arena when you get done? Oh, you poor things. <laughs> and how many of you are actually working in a startup or an early stage company right now? Oh, my. Well, there's a medication available for, <laughs> for you. Um, I'd love a little sample of what the ongoing businesses are. Is it a dog walking service for dual income families? Is it uh, an AI inspired way of making curry? I mean, what is it that you have? So somebody who's got an ongoing venture, kindly raise your hand and, and uh, don't tell us anything confidential, but give us sort of a little thumbnail of what your business is. No, I, I think you can just talk loud for this. Okay, Victoria. Um, it's a software that matches tutors and students in a virtual classroom. Okay, so the premise is you've got students who need tutors and tutors who've got a little free time and wouldn't mind earning some money. But if the tutor knows all about chemistry and the student wants to know about Celtic mythology, it might not be the best match. So you use your software to match them. Did I get that right? Okay, good. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, it's a platform that scales personalized professional development. Well, everybody I know needs that. Who's going to pay you? Uh, well, we have B2B and B2C. Okay. So B2B presumably would be company clients who say, I've got this engineer, he's a genius, but he can't get along with his mother, and he needs a little training. And the B2C would be people who say, I'm a genius, but nobody likes me. <laughs> Do I have that right? Good, good. All right, well, um, I uh, am going to ask for your attention for the next... 80 minutes or so, and I have this quaint idea that if you're going to give me your attention, I should try to give you back something in return that's worth your investment. So there will be some things that I hope you are able to do or able to think about when you leave here that maybe are new to you for now. But my agenda, tell me what you're working on. I think a few of you have already done that. I'm going to try to persuade you before this session is over that you can't afford to go out into the market and promote your product or service. That what you have to do is turn that telescope around and go find your customer. And I hope to tell you some hot tips as to how you can find them, succeed with your business. But as Joe pointed out in his opening remarks, this is not a class of theory. Um, we have arrows in our backs and blood all over our knees from our own work in the startup world. Um, I'm currently running my fourth startup, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of stuff I've done and walk through, with your help, lessons I hope I've learned and maybe lessons that you've learned. There are going to be a couple of chances for some of you to revisit this whole pitch notion, probably not with somebody who will cheat and buy you another 30 seconds. And then we'll wrap it up. So my background, I'm currently running a company called Scientific Nutrition Products. We make a two and a half ounce beverage of just food ingredients that helps you sleep. And our target customers are competitive athletes because we tell them better performance and better recovery through better sleep. That's the business I'm in now. I spent a little time in a boutique consulting firm 
I took a break from entrepreneurship for a while and, and ran a small company that's publicly traded in Hong Kong. This was a turnaround. There were lots of things wrong with it. I fired 75 people. I had a low need to be liked for a couple years, and I fixed the business. Three medical companies, a couple of halfway normal jobs, spent a little time in school, and that's my weekend thing. So, yes, I'm still playing. And no, I will not try to persuade you that I'm a killer guitar player. Okay. Some years ago, in the last recession, there were a lot of companies that died and some that succeeded. And the Wall Street Journal did a pretty in-depth study of who made it through all of that. And it turned out there were two strategies. Some went down the path of being the lowest cost provider. That's not you. The other was the group that focused on building their brand. They were innovators. And they went out and asked a fundamental question. How's your end user dissatisfied? Because that's where opportunity is. Now, in an institute like this, it's tempting to think, well, it ought to include algorithms or something. But the fact is, if there's 50 kids in town who want a bicycle and there's no bicycle shop, that's an unmet need. That's an opportunity. It can be quite basic. I'm going to make a couple of assertions. Your business might struggle along, but I don't think it's going to prosper until you know a couple of fundamental things. What are you really selling? And who cares? Not rhetorically, but specifically. Who wants that? And how do I find them? So let me elaborate on that a little bit. I think there's some questions that look deceptively simple. But if you slow down and actually start to think about them, <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope this won't happen to any of you, but I, I did this one year with a group of entrepreneurs in Kansas. And midway through the first morning, this very aggressive, very accomplished woman got up and went to the ladies' room and sat in there and wept for about 20 minutes, called her husband, said, I'm a failure. I don't have a business. I quit. I'm coming home. He'd been married to her for 19 years, so he just said, knock it off. But the questions were basic. What's the unmet need? What's broke? that I fix? How do you know that there's a need for your restaurant application? Right? What's broke that we fix? And who cares? How are they trying, who's trying to fix the problem and how many of them are out there? Do they have any money? So Gustavo and I could, for example, put our heads together and say, we're smart guys and we know a lot of stuff about how startups can succeed. Let's start a business. Can we find them? Yeah, just go to the CIC and look for people wearing hoodies and flip-flops and say them the word disrupt. That's, they're entrepreneurs. <laughs> Do they have any money? No. Oops, terrible idea for a business. How do I find them? How do I let them know about us? How are they solving the problem now? And please don't tell me about your technology. Tell me why they will find your solution to be better. I really don't care if you use fewer lines of code than somebody else. Tell me why your customer will think what you have is better than what they're spending their money on now. And speaking of which, who's actually going to pay you? It's not uncommon, for example, in the medical world where you have a doctor who says, I like it, I'm going to recommend it. You have a patient who has to go off and buy it or take it, and you have a some sort of third-party reimbursement service that has to agree that they're going to reimburse for this. So you have this kind of constellation. And if you don't understand all that, you have a hobby or you have a philanthropy, but you don't have a business. Now, many of you will think about raising capital. Well, it's a kind of a dirty secret, but many investors, particularly the professionals, live in constant fear. So let's say I'm an investor, and let's say my Aunt Millie died and left me $10 million, and I would like to invest some of it in promising entrepreneurs. And I see you two and you three and you two and you three. 
And they think, well, you're smart. I'm sure you're charming. You're probably kind to animals. Statistically, seven or eight of you will fail. That's just the way the stats work. So I don't want to invest in all 10 of you. I'd like to invest in the two or three of you who won't fail. And this is a great fear because if I make money with Aunt Millie's money, I can go to my other relatives and raise more money, maybe pay myself. If I lose Aunt Millie's money, oops, now I am driving for Uber. So I'm going to try to determine, do you have a chance of succeeding with your business? And there's only one non-negotiable requirement. You have to have customers. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be good looking. If you have customers, people will think you're smart. You will make money. And if you make enough money, they will think you're good looking. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's cynical. So as a consequence, every serious evaluator, and that should include you because you're investing as well, your time and all three of your remaining brain cells after you complete a program like this, do you have any customers? Will you have any? Do, do you know that you need them? How many do you need to make money? How much is your customer worth? If your customer's worth $3 and it costs you $5 to find them, that's probably not a sustainable proposition. You guys with me so far? OK, two descriptors that you want. You'd like to have something that's unique and important. That's the sweet spot. So examples. I think we probably would agree that air is important, arguably not unique. And I don't want any of you to burst into tears or anything, but we'd probably argue that MIT decals are unique, but not all of us would consider them important. So can you make a business out of this? Can you make a business selling air? Yes, no? I'm sorry, say that again. You saw them selling air in Iceland. Yeah, they uh, had a can and it said fresh mountain air inside. And you could actually purchase. Well, the that's can. a niche market. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, if you're knocking around Beijing. Any of you guys ever scuba dive? I had the good fortune to do my checkout dive off Catalina Island, California. I was actually down about 100 feet through the kelp beds. It's like swimming through a redwood forest. It was pretty intense. And all of a sudden, I looked at the little gizmo on, on my wrist and said, hmm, I'd pay a lot for some extra air, right? So, and of course, if I said, well, We've got a product that costs about 12 or 13 cents, and we could sell it for five or six bucks. You'd say, nah. But for proud parents, you can, right? So I'm being a little bit facetious, but there is a point here, which is you want to find out who is going to find your offer compelling, important, and unique. So air for scuba divers. You guys ever see that bubble pack stuff? You can hand it to your friends and set your watch, within 10 seconds, they'll start popping the bubbles. That company does about $6 billion in its annual sales. It's called Sealed Air Corporation. It's positioning. That's all it is, right? Figure out how to find them, tell them what you've got, and take their money. OK, this is a, a Boston joke. What happens if you can't meet those two requirements? What kind of fish is that? It's a flounder. I'm sorry, that's dry, but that's what's going to happen to your business if you can't do those first two things. OK, let me give you an example. I was living in sunny Southern California, working for a company in the clinical nutrition business. It had been 200 million a year for 12 years. And an entrepreneur came in, brought the company, took it private, fired the senior management team, brought in some energetic new folks. Everybody got some stock. 
and said, I want to bump this up 50% in three years and take it public. Pretty aggressive. And the stock, of course, was a brilliant idea because suddenly I didn't care whether I was right or you were right. What I cared about was let's get the right answer and then our stock will be worth something. I'd like to buy a boat. Right? So, the division I was running was clinical nutrition and we were making an obscene amount of money. We would make a liter of solution that we'd sell to the uh, emergency rooms, I'm sorry, the <coughs> intensive care units. We'd make it for $3 a liter and sell it for 70. So, yeah, nice business. So I was managing a large percentage of the company's gross profits. But I went out into the marketplace, talked to customers, which is a bad habit, figured out that this was all gonna go away because the market was soon going to no, not be willing to pay 100% more for something that was 5% better. I thought, oops. It's good that I see it coming, but I'm losing some sleep. I better find a new opportunity, and I think I found one. Potential repositioning of the company. Nobody in the country had done it. By the way, those words should go on your tombstone. Right? Nobody in the country has done it before means look out. Here was the deal. Because I had worked at Baxter, I'd been in the renal failure business, and I knew something about kidney failure and dialysis, and I knew that the, though it's tragic, the market was growing. I know that patients on dialysis are in a medical center three times a week, tethered to a machine for three or four hours, and those centers are in a government publication. So I know who you are, and I know where you're gonna be Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So I can find you. If your kidneys fail, you can't do what so many of us do routinely. We call it hydration. You can't casually take in fluids because part of what your kidneys are supposed to do is help you eliminate those fluids. If you can't eliminate them, you start expanding. It's not uncommon to gain eight to 10 pounds between Monday and Wednesday. So you are fluid restricted. But because of other things that your kidneys do for you, you also become malnourished. And all of the nutrition supplements that were available were liquids. I said, well, duh. That's a marketing expression. That's bad. Why don't we make something that's high in the things you should be consuming and low in the things you shouldn't be consuming and no fluids? It's, it'll be a candy bar. Right? We had the technology. Let's call it Regain. We didn't need to do a clinical trial, but we were ethical. We did. Those of you who are familiar with California know Kaiser Permanente. They did the trial. We got it published in a peer-reviewed journal. Bottom line was the product worked. It improved the health of the kidney failure patients. We said, well, we might have something here. So we knew that the patients see a doc and they see a dietitian. We know how to do this. Let's go find the smart ones and ask them what they think. So we said, well, here's an idea. We'd love to know your thoughts. Would you recommend it? Yeah. Really? How many of your patients? All of them. Really? How many days a week would you recommend that they take it? Seven. How do you feel about three bucks a bar? Hmm, sounds right. So, ooh, well, how do you feel about it's standing next to the competition. They said, you're the only one that isn't a liquid. You got this feel to yourself. I said, oh my. Ran the numbers, looked like a pretty good business, particularly since we'd have it to ourselves. We did a revenue forecast, and showed the company that there was some money we were gonna lose because the healthcare market was changing. Here was some replacement money and an opportunity for some significant growth. We brought in the photographers, took the beauty shots of the product, brought in the sales force, walked them through all the commission programs, launched the product, went to market. And it was a complete disaster. Every month we came in less than 10% of what we forecast we would do. What did I do wrong? I'm sorry, I heard a voice, but I see nothing. One more time. It didn't taste good. Well, we thought it tasted good. 
What we didn't realize was that when your kidneys fail, your palate shifts. One of the things we needed to provide was protein, and protein tastes like spoiled meat to a person whose kidneys have failed. But that was only one of the problems. What else? Yes, sir. Oh my God, you may skip the entire remainder of the class. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. We surveyed the clinicians, but they don't buy it and they don't eat it. Oops. When we finally got around to talking to the patients, they didn't want it and they couldn't afford it. Now, why wouldn't they want it? Well, you have an answer? Yes, sir. It made them thirsty. No. Well, it might have, but that wasn't the reason. There was a more fundamental problem. Who gets kidney failure? Well, 44% of them get there from a lifetime of mismanaging their high blood pressure, and 33% of them get there from a lifetime of mismanaging their diabetes. So three quarters of my prospective customers have abused themselves for their whole life. Why would they change now? And by the way, once they end up in one of these dialysis centers tethered to a machine, a well-intentioned social worker comes along and says, well, you're obviously not working anymore. I'll put you on public aid. Now they don't have any money. And if they do have money, they're going to spend it on beer and cigarettes, not on my product. There was one more reason. Retailers wouldn't carry it. We had been selling to hospitals. This was a product that customers were going to have to go someplace else and buy, like a drugstore. Now, if you ever want a little entertainment, walk into a busy pharmacist, pharmacy, CVS, Walgreens, find the pharmacist and say, I have a product you've never heard of from a company that you've never done business with for a group of patients who don't want it and don't have any money. And I'd like you to carry it and watch what they do. <laughs> if you're lucky, it'll be laughter. So I struggled with this for a while. Finally, one day, a kindly pharmacist pulled me aside. He could tell I was just baffled. And he said, Bob, this is a linear foot of shelf space. I carry Crest toothpaste on this linear foot. And I have all manner of algorithms that tell me within a couple of dollars each month how much money I'm going to get from this linear foot of shelf space. If I shove that stuff off and put your stuff on, I can't think of any reason why I should lose any money. So don't go to any trouble. Write me a check. Now, they call it slotting fees. You might call it extortion. <laughs> but the amounts are substantial. At the time, it was a million dollars a quarter, plus 6% of our top line revenues, plus we had to put two units of each SKU, I hope you know what that means, we had, into every one of their drugstores for free. And if anybody reordered, then they would pay us for the reorder in about 90 days. I said, oh dear. We're going to have to find a way around this. But back to me for a moment. We were on track to show Wall Street that we were a good candidate for an IPO. And my colleagues and I were all counting on the IPO to make that stock we got worth something. And I put us at risk. And every month, we'd have a senior management meeting, and there'd be 12 or 13 of us in the room, and we'd go about the table, and we'd report on how our business was doing. And they'd say, so, Bob, how's Regain doing? And your forecast for the month was 400,000. How'd you do? 12. Uh, excuse me. 12. <laughs> well, this was embarrassing. And I would say things like, well, you know, it's just taking longer to get started than we expected. But hang in there. It's going to go. We've got this market to ourselves. But it didn't. It just went on and on. It's like a slow motion train wreck. 
for a whole year. Suffice to say, it ruined a year of my life. So we said, well, if 75% of the people have not taken care of themselves, there's still 25%. We ought to be able to find them. We ought to be able to reach them. Somebody ought to pay for it. Now, you probably know this, but Medicare takes care of you if you're old. Medicaid takes care of you if you're broke. Medicare is a federal program. Medicaid is state by state. So what do you think are the chances that Illinois and Indiana have the same Medicaid program? So we persisted. We got it reimbursed in 40 states, which was almost as much fun as 40 root canals. Felt really bad, said this is a terrible way to make a living, sold the business. We found an outfit that specialized in reaching these dialysis patients. We had clinical trials. We were the crown jewel in their little list of offerings, and we made about $1 on the whole business. Postscript, we did well enough in the rest of the stuff that we did go public. The stock was worth something, and I, I was not hung from a lamppost someplace. Example number two. By the way, this will show you the truth of one of the things Joe said early on about entrepreneurship being an affliction. This will show you a triumph of entrepreneurship over common sense. I went out and did two more of these businesses. And I, I managed to get to know the docs at Harvard Med School. They had sort of the same idea I did. They asked me if I wanted to start a business with them. I said, no, absolutely not. There's nobody on the planet worse to do a business with than a bunch of doctors. And, and the smart ones are the worst. But we're in San Antonio. Come on, I'll buy you a taco and a tequila, and we'll hang out for a while. We did. One day they called and said, we found some seed capital contingent on finding a CEO, and we can't find but one person in the country who's taken this kind of science and put it on the shelf in Walgreens. Would you meet our investors? And long story short, I moved to Boston, and we started a company, Medical Foods, Inc. So we looked over all their projects. How long before they'll be in the marketplace? Two and a half years, three years, four years, oh dear. I'm way too neurotic to babysit a bunch of scientists for that amount of time, and we're gonna run out of money. So, how you guys feel about diabetes? Oh, we like diabetes. Okay, <laughs> so. Here's a little bit about diabetes. At the time, there were 10 million people now. Unfortunately, that number has more than doubled since then. And it, it is a direct consequence of the often discussed obesity epidemic. What happens when you have diabetes is you can't, is your blood sugar goes too high unless you inject insulin, which brings your blood sugar back down. And if it goes, if it stays too high for too long, bad things happen. If it goes too low, bad things happen. You always want to try to keep it within the range. I'll elaborate on that in a moment. At the time, 40% of those patients were using insulin. Others were using drugs, and in some cases, trying to do it, just managing their food intake. But if you get the insulin part wrong, you're at risk of your blood sugar going too low. So if your blood sugar stays too high for a while, it causes blindness, uh, kidney failure, and amputation of your feet. This is bad. So a program called Tight Control was implemented. You eat three small meals a day, small snacks in between, regular small injections of insulin. You keep the fluctuation relatively restricted. The problem is the incidence of low blood sugar tripled when that happened. And with low blood sugar, you've got to treat it right away because people faint. This can be bad if you're stuck in a traffic jam out on 128. And if it happens while you're asleep, you may not wake up. This is particularly troubling at night because nobody's going to wake themselves up three times a night to eat something and inject insulin. So what they do is they try and eat a big snack and take a big injection of insulin and hope that they balance each other. It doesn't work because the insulin lasts all night long, but the food doesn't. 
the food turns into glucose at the same time. The spike is higher, but the duration is no longer. And the translation is that by about 2 o'clock in the morning, the insulin is working, the food isn't, and you are at risk of lapsing into a coma. So, we started having focus groups with people who were taking insulin for their diabetes, and one evening I lost control of myself, had a little temper tantrum, threw the moderator out, went in and flopped down at the table and said, well, we've been talking about this for about an hour, and, and we've not gotten to something I think is really critical. What's your greatest fear? Never mind all the intellectual stuff. What's your greatest fear? Anybody want to hazard a guess at what the answer was? Sorry? Pretty close. After they, I mean, by this point, they were reasonably comfortable, and they'd say, you know, I actually don't sleep in a bed. I sleep in that recliner in my living room because I'm afraid if I get too comfortable, that's it. Okay, that's bad if you're a grown-up. If you're talking about your little eight-year-old daughter, it's really bad. And what we would find was, in talking to the parents, was that every night at 2 o'clock in the morning, they'd be looking at their little daughter, trying to figure out, is she asleep or is she in a coma? And the only way to find out is to say, hey, wake up. What, what, what? You all right? Yeah, I was asleep. Oh, good, go back to sleep. <laughs> and it sounds funny, but all you have to do is have the EMTs come to your house once to revive a kid that's in a coma, and you never forget it. And come to think of it, the kid doesn't forget it. So we said, well, this is not intellectual. So we came up with something. It was three ingredients, sucrose, protein, uncooked cornstarch. Those things are in a birthday cake. But they turn into glucose at different times. And being marketers, of course, we called it timed release glucose. We needed to give it a non-medical name and non-medical packaging. Why is that? I'm sorry? Well, kids and grown-ups alike were buying it. I'm sorry? Make it look trendy? Friendly. That's a better guess. We're getting warm. Yes, sir. And why is that important? I'm sorry? I uh, was spending time arm wrestling with the FDA. I really wanted to be able to say four people with diabetes on the label. And finally, a couple of our customers slapped me upside the head and said, Bob, if you do that, I won't buy the product. because it's nobody's damn business whether or not I have diabetes. If I've had to stay at work a long time and I'm getting a little low and I need to take this thing out, I don't want it to look like I'm afflicted and I'm medicating myself. I said, whoa, <laughs> thank you. What should it look like? Well, I don't know, make it look like an energy bar. Make it look like something an elite athlete would buy. I said, okay, that's when we came up with this for the nutritional management of hypoglycemia. We ended up selling some of this to marathon runners. We said, I could use that. I'm out there running for 26 miles. I couldn't run 26 blocks, but they were out there doing it. <laughs> so this time around, we engaged clinicians, parents, patients. When we were looking at the product for children, we ended up in a whole bunch of elementary schools, sitting in those little bitty stools that are this high, talking to other parents about what it was like to have a kid who had diabetes. We found an ad agency that was familiar with this field, and we said, where do these people go for information? And they all read one of three or four magazines. What do the ads look like? Well, the back cover of the current issue of the biggest magazine was a full-page blow-up of a hypodermic needle. Say, what? Well, the point is, my needle is sharper than your needle, and it doesn't hurt as much, so buy mine. I said, oh, gross. So we ran an ad that was flying pigs. 
with some really silly copy about to sleep perchance to dream, et cetera, caught a lot of people's attention. We stuck a little violator across the corner of the page that said, call this 800 number for a sample. And we started getting calls. We didn't know if we had a business here or not. We started getting 100 calls a day. We said, oh, we need more phones. We started getting 200 calls a day. We said, oh, God. We were in Kendall Square. We said, there's more geniuses per square foot here than most places. So we walked out on the corner with a mirror. And we'd hold it under somebody's nose, and if it fogged up, we'd offer them a job. <laughs> 300 calls a day, we said all this stuff about index cards isn't going to get it. We're going to have to install a database. 500 calls a day, we needed more tables and chairs. And we said, you know, we might be on to something. We hired and trained an inside sales force. And I'm going to tell you part of the end of the story, which is we got into every major pharmacy chain in the country and paid zero in slotting fees. This had never been done before. So there's a lesson here, which was understanding our customer helped us invent a better product and build a better business. But there's some questions that you should have at this point. How did we find them? How did we tell them about the value proposition? And at the risk of being coarse, how did we separate them from their money? So we said, where do they go for advice? What do they read? Who do they believe? Whom do they believe? Where do they spend their money now to address this problem? OK, we also had to be pragmatic. There are a fair number of people who have diabetes who do not have a commitment to taking care of themselves. They won't spend any money to take care of themselves, however persuasive our medical information might be. They're not going to do it. So we said, how do we find that percentage, that segment that is dedicated to taking care of themselves and is already spending money as a proof point for doing that. And the answer is they're paying somebody called a certified diabetes educator. This is a credential that you get usually after being a pharmacist or, or maybe a dietitian. They congregate around the major metropolitan areas because they can charge more. And they have an association. Surprisingly enough, it's called the American Association of Diabetes Educators. They have a little tab on there that says locate an educator. If you click on that and type in 02142, out pops a list of all of the educators and their contact information. So when the patients talk to the educator, they think they're hearing the voice of God. Way more credible than listening to me. So we said, well, let's talk to the educators. Maybe let's briefly think of them as our customer. What do they worry about? And what's the unmet need? How can we help them? Well, I'm going to tell you what we did, but I will tell you that the end of the story, of that chunk of story, is we ended up with several thousand highly credentialed sales reps who worked for us for nothing. Not a bad trick. So we had this little flow chart. We said, gosh, if we call in the diabetes educator, and she, because they're overwhelmingly female, likes it, she'll tell her patients, and her patients will buy from us, and we'll make a little bit of money. But we're not going to get to heaven doing that, because we kind of need to be in the retailers. Now, I've already told you, that's an economically onerous proposition. But we thought, well, maybe we could have the educator call the retailer. Maybe we could have the patient call the retailer. And then maybe we'd call the retailer. And if the retailer agreed to buy, ooh, a multiple of the money. That was the vision. How do we do it? Well, it's noteworthy that we changed our definition of customer, right? Because our customer now is the retailer. Everybody understand? With me? OK. So we got all these calls. By the way, somewhere we slipped up and put something in the copy that said it tastes a bit like fudge brownies. 
and the word got out that we were giving away free brownies. So not every phone call that we got had anything to do with diabetes. <laughs> I don't know how this happens, but it does. <laughs> so we said, well, we need a qualifying question to separate the winners from the losers here. So we talked about this with our little inside sales force. They were answering the phone. The question was, what brand of insulin are you using at the moment? And if they said, what? Sorry, we don't have anything for you. Right? So we would ask the qualifying questions. If they gave the right answer, we'd send them a sample. Did you get it? Yes. Who can tell us the difference between an open-ended question and a closed-ended question? Well, if you don't know this, I'm going to change your life in the next couple of minutes. Yes, sir. Closed-ended question, you can answer yes or no. Open-ended question, you have to actually provide a response that's more than yes or no. That's exactly the right answer. Did you all hear that? Closed-ended question, you answer yes or no. Open-ended question, you have to actually elaborate and say something. So we learned that if we said, did you like it? And they said, no. And went, so now what? So we said, well, what'd you think of it? And they might say, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't like the way it tasted. <coughs> okay, what else? Well, it worked great. Okay, what else? Well, I think I'm gonna reorder. Open-ended questions. If, if you do any customer contact or investor relations or anything else, closed-ended questions will paint you in a corner like that. So. We'd say, well, what'd you think? We'd say, you know, we can't keep giving it to you, but we will pay the shipping. Would you like to order? They'd say, yeah, send me a six pack. So we'd set a little timer and we'd call them up a couple days later and say, aren't you about out? Isn't it time to reorder? Okay, so we were establishing a bit of a relationship with individual consumers. <laughs> then we'd set the hook. We'd say, well, no more free shipping. That's going to increase your effective cost. Wouldn't it make more sense for you to just pick it up where you buy your insulin? Yeah. Well, where is that? Oh, I buy every, every week from Jake's Pharmacy. We'd say, really? Yeah. Well, can we call Jake and tell him that you'd like to buy this? Yeah, you're damn right. Hold on a second. Let me call him up. Tell him that Elmer said, I'm coming in there in a couple of days and I'm buying this stuff, and if he doesn't have it, I'm going to be pissed. He said, well, okay, Elmer, <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. And we'd call three or four more people in and around Jake's pharmacy until we got this answer. Now, you ever watch the pharmacist answer the phone? It looks like this. Pharmacy. You got 12 seconds. We clocked this. You got 12 seconds. Jake, four of your customers are buying our product for diabetes. They want to buy it from you, and you don't have it. What? Who is this? All right, here's a little statistic. Maybe 4% of the people in the country have diabetes. They're responsible for about 25% of retail pharmacy purchases. Because you go in and buy toothpaste and a greeting card, probably a late birthday card for your mom. People with diabetes go in and they buy insulin, needles, glucose strips, glucometers. These are valuable customers. So when I call Jake up and say, I've got some, and they'd like to buy my product from you, then he's thinking, oh, God, if I don't have it, they're going to go across the street, and I'm going to lose a valuable customer. So Jake would say, well, look, you know, <coughs> we're a Walgreens, and I can't be buying stuff without corporate approval. And we'd say, we know that, Jake. But we also know that there's a number below which you can buy without checking with the corporation, and I'm betting it's 100 bucks. Well, yeah, actually, that's right. You will be pleased to know that our starter kit costs 
and I will be happy to take a purchase order from you. And by the way, if it doesn't sell, don't send it back to us. Throw it in the trash. We will believe you, and we'll send you a refund. We'll take all of the risk. Really? So we'd collect the order. Nobody ever mentioned slotting fees. What did we have that gave us the power to do this without slotting fees? One word answer. Demand. Customers. Thank you. What's the title of my talk? Finding your... Okay. So, back to these diabetes educators. How did we get this leverage? Well, we said, let's think of them as our customer. And let's call them up. What made you become a CDE? How long you been at it? What do you like about it? And what is your greatest professional frustration? Answer? I tell them what to do and they don't do it. Ah. Well, what if we had something invented by a bunch of snotty doc, oh, excuse me, at Harvard Medical School, and it tasted great, and your customers, your patients loved it and came in and said, this stuff is awesome, thank you so much. I said, well, I'd probably fall to my knees and shout hallelujah. Well, we've got it. Do you have about 15 or 20 seconds while I tell you a little bit about it? By all means. So. It works, your patients will love it. They tell their patients. We'd say, well, Susie, we understand that many people in your profession have a Saturday session once a month where you bring in all your patients and you tell them about new developments. Is that true of you? Yes, it is. When's your next one? About a week and a half. Do you have all your content yet? Well, now, nobody's ever got their content a week and a half before the thing. I mean, Joe and I put our talks together about a half hour before class started tonight. So the answer was always, well, you know, I probably got a little room in there. I'd say, well, if you liked this, would you tell your patients about it? Well, yeah, I, but I got to know that it works, and I got to know that it tastes like it. We can save you the trouble, Susie. We can tell you that they're going to have three questions. What's it taste like? How much does it cost, and where can I get it? We'll send you some samples. We'll send you the clinicals. You'll be assured that it works. You can slice up the samples and give everybody a little piece. They can figure out what it tastes like. Cost a dollar a bar. I need your help to answer the third question, where can I get it? You probably send your patients someplace. Oh, yes, here in Amarillo, Texas, I always send them to Yost's Drug Store. Well, can I call Yost? No, I'll call Yost. I'll tell him to get his raggedy butt in here and stand up and tell the patients himself that he's got the product. Well, golly, you better call Yost and tell him you're going to do that. Yost, you're going to need to buy some of this stuff before Susie goes on a rampage because on Saturday in a week and a half, she's sending a bunch of her patients to your drugstore to buy something you don't have. And they're going to be honked off if you don't have it. So, you have a couple minutes while we fix this problem? Well, yeah. No mention of slotting fees. You've seen this question before. What gave us the ability to do that? The one word answer is? Thank you. Okay, we yes ma'am. Not a penny. Not a, but next Tuesday, we're gonna have a session on presenting your venture. And one of the things we're going to talk about in there is how do you hire somebody when you don't have enough money to pay them what they can get in the market? And part of the answer is that compensation involves more than cash. These people went into the business to be healers, and they are dedicated to that. And they're endlessly frustrated when they tell a patient what to do. The patient says, yeah, yeah, and doesn't do it. So we gave them an opportunity for some professional fulfillment, and they found that more than satisfactory. We literally never had a single one ask us for any kind of cash compensation. It's kind of surprising, but true. Okay, 
we said after a while, we have painted ourselves into a corner. Because most of these retailers have about 8,000 stock keeping units, SKUs, in their store. And they don't want 8,000 invoices. So they buy their stuff from a, somebody called a wholesaler. A wholesaler comes in with this big bin, and B-I-N, and it's got penicillin, greeting cards, cat food, toothpaste, one invoice. So we said, well, if we really want to make this work, we're going to have to get into the wholesalers. Now, drugstores, pharmacists actually care about patient health. Wholesalers don't. They want dollars in, dollars out, inventory turns, not many re re repeats and returns and so forth. But if you can do it, suddenly you have aggregated your business into a larger entity and make more money. So once again, we have changed our definition of customer. Are you guys tracking all this? My first customer was the patient. Next customer was the diabetes educator. Next customer was the retail pharmacy. Now the customer is wholesalers. So we had a little staff meeting and said, these guys don't know us from Adam's cat. And they don't give a damn about the health and well-being of the patients who take this. So how are we going to get in there? Because we're not going to spend any money on them. This was a little subversive, but we figured out that there was a trade show going on in New Orleans in a few weeks, and we were going to be there. We were going to have a booth set up. We were going to be seeing patients, educators, and it was reasonable to believe that we'd be generating some business. And the business would spill out of the con convention center into the neighborhoods around the convention center, hopefully looking for our product. So we called up the 25 drugstores that were near there and said, here's the deal. In a week and a half, we're going to be at, here's what we're going to be talking about, here's who we're talking to. We think a fair number of them are going to go looking for the product when they get done. We would like to make sure you have some in stock. Let's work something out. They all went for it, said, yep, yep, I know the show. I know the educators you're talking about. You sound credible. It's short money for us. Let's do it. Then we called their wholesaler and said, you don't know us, but I've just built in some free profit for you. I'm selling this product retail at a dollar a bar. The pharmacist is buying it from us for 75 cents a bar. One day, I hope they buy it from you for 68 cents a bar. What I'm going to do is take that difference between the 68 and 75 and mail it to you. You don't have to do a thing. I'll stock the pharmacies myself. All you have to do is two things. One, take our money, and two, Put us in your system so that if these pharmacies enjoy reorders, I can say, your wholesaler already has us in the system. Place it with your wholesaler. They said, yep, they did it, and we ended up in the major wholesalers, again, for free. One last story. We got a piece of postal mail. It's like a stamp on it. Archaic, I realize. It's from a pharmacy chain big in the southeast. And they said, we're drawing up our planogram for the coming year. Who can tell us what a planogram is? Oh, you are virgins, aren't you? Yes, sir. It's like a digital makeup of your shelving piece of paper. Exactly right. Bingo. Or if you walk into CVS, they've always got the toothpaste lined up just so. This is actually, for those of you in the materials planning business, logistics business, et cetera, this is actually pretty methodical. And Walmart has a building that's about a block long in lovely Bentonville, Arkansas. Spent a whole week there one night, um, where they have mock-ups of retail shelves. And they figure out which things should be at eye level and which things should be down here, all that, right? And they drop the planogram, and it's 
executed with not many variations across the whole chain. So they said, if you want to be in our planogram for the coming year, kind of a big deal, you have to attend a 15-minute meeting in Clearwater, Florida. I had no idea what this was about. So I called around and said, what's this about? And my more knowledgeable friend said, well, basically they're trying to set up which vendors they pick. Who makes the decision? Well, there's a guy named Jeff, and you don't want his job, because Jeff's going to sit there and hear one fevered vendor pitch after another for 15 minutes at a time all day long for an entire week. And these people are going to come in, and they're going to offer to pick up his dry cleaning and walk his dog and tell him how wonderful he is and anything else they can think of to get him to say yes. I said, oh, dear. Well, we don't have any money. But I was feeling pugnacious and said, let's do it. So two of us packed a little briefcase and went to Clearwater, Florida. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we're sitting in the lobby, pretty large area, and there are all these people with mock-ups of end caps, you know, the things at the end of an aisle full of suntan lotion and all that stuff. And big things to showing their ad campaigns. Everybody's got props, and we're just sitting there like homeless people. And when our slot came, we went in, and I said, Jeff, this isn't going to be like any other 15-minute segment you've had or will have this week because we don't have any money and we're not going to give you a nickel. But what I'd like to do is spend five minutes telling you who we are, five minutes telling you about the product, and five minutes telling you why you, you want us in your stores. And he said, well... You're a 15 minute sport, knock yourself out. So the first five minutes is we're so fabulous. And the next five minutes, our product is so fabulous. The last five minutes, we pulled out a printout. I said, Jeff, here are the individuals that we've been doing business with, people with diabetes, in the states where you have stores. There's 10,000 of them. We're tired of being in the shipping business. We'd like to send them to a retailer. And all 10,000 have the same question. Which retailer should I go to to buy your product? How would you like us to answer their question? Jeff sat there for about a minute without saying a word. Now, if you don't think a minute is a long time, hold your breath. <laughs> but one of the rules in negotiating usually is the first person to speak loses. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we just sat there <laughs> thinking, oh, God. <laughs> At the end of the minute, he said, OK, you're in. Yes. So we said, well. We want to stage it. We need a little time to make sure our customers know, so we'll do it. And the state's rolling it out. You know, we want st staged growth, blah, blah, blah. But there was no mention of slotting fees, and I know you can guess what the next bullet's going to be. Okay, so the business grew a lot. We had an extraordinarily high reorder rate. General Mills would love to have Cheerios in every pantry in here, and they would be thrilled if you bought once a month a new box of Cheerios. We had an organization go out and survey our customers and discovered that the reorder rate was 286 times a year. This makes people swoon. So it worked out. So I've told you two stories. I've tried to learn some things from this, but I would like your help. Help me summarize this. Now, there's two reasons why you should do this. One is because I'm running another venture and I need the help. And the other is that many of you are about to run a business and you might find it useful. So what 
should I have learned from these two sets of experiences? This is where I stand here until you answer. I beg your pardon? Know your, customer. know your customer. What does that mean? Uh, you're right. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'd just like you to elaborate. Okay. Who they are, what <laughs> needs they have that are unmet, what value are you providing to them? I think the man deserves a round of applause. That was pretty good. <laughs> good. What else? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I'm too far away from you. Say again. understand who owns the customer. Uh, in, in the second example, clearly you are the one driving the customer from one retailer to another. So that's why you have the bargaining power. That's such an important insight. I have to tell you that when you, uh, we were talking to these retail pharmacists, they were really quite snotty to us. They would say, look, I am your only path to reach the customers. If you don't get on my shelf, you don't have a business. So let's talk about how much money you're going to give me. I mean, they were very arrogant. I mean, I mean in your face, right? And... I was offended by this. <laughs> I said, that's just not true. And your point's exactly right. I said, I think all these, and they were guys, they were all male, all these tough guys are going to roll over if I show up with a bunch of customers. They don't own the customers. The, the ownership goes to the person who solves the problem. Yes, sir. Well, I don't want to make this sound like it was linear and logical and that we knew what we were doing. We did not. We were making it up as we went along. So we, we blundered atrociously in some cases. But when we had a retailer who'd bought from us two or three times in a row and then would squawk about it, we'd say, well, what's going on? And they'd say, I, I can't handle these piddly little invoices you're sending me. Why don't you get with my wholesaler? Oh. Right? So it was constant communication. And this was kind of an obsession of mine. We had people who were better than me at managing the sales force. And God knows we had people who were better than me at keeping track of the accounting and all of that stuff. But boy, I went after those customers like, like a dog after a bone. I really wanted to know. So, but back to lessons. What else should I have learned? Uh, you say who your customer was. So, uh, good. Good. Saying, Be flexible and let your definition of who your customer is evolve with your business. And that, that allows you to transition over and over again to greater and more. One hopes. One hopes. Know your customers intimately. What are they really buying? This was your point. Products that are for everyone, I hate to tell you this, they're not for anyone. Right? Remember our example about air? You gotta dial it down. And you need to face it. It doesn't matter what it is you're about to sell. They don't need it. What they need is the benefit. I actually don't need these glasses I'm wearing. What I need is to see better. Now, I hired glasses to do that for myself. Some of you, I can pretty well guarantee, hired contact lenses, and you probably know somebody who hired the LASIK surgeon to do that little drill. If you take one thing away from my talk tonight, it should be this slide as it unfolds. Many people start doing market segmentation, and they talk in terms of, I want women age 30 to 45 with a household income of 100K a year or more. I say no, not for a startup. What you should segment them by is who wants it the worst? Motivation, 
I was at one point in my checkered past in the weight loss business, and there were ladies out there who were a size four who did not need my product, but they thought they should be a size two, and they wanted my product. They were my customer. So who's motivated? So who's feeling the pain right now? So if yesterday you had your first heart attack and you survived, if you didn't, you're not my customer, and I have something that will prevent you from having a second heart attack, you're in the top. If I'm your brother, thinking, well, we've got the same makeup, I'm worried. If you're kind of a family relative, I think, well, all right, I'll, you know, mind the calories and the carbs and et cetera. Now, many people look at something like this and say, yeah, but there's so many people down here. Why aren't we going after the big market? My opinion, if you're running a startup, don't do it. That's a graveyard. Right? Start at the top. Two reasons. First, if you can't build a business with those people, you don't have a business. Think of yourself as the jockey, the business is the horse. You might love your horse, but you might be disciplined enough to say, this horse ain't going to finish the race. I'm putting it out to pasture and finding another horse. Uh, I would have said shoot the thing, but some of you are sensitive. <laughs> so if you can't build a business up there, you don't have a business. Second, that's the fastest way to get traction, get reorders, get early stage revenue. You can work your way down, but as you get further down, if you do it right, some large corporation will show up and say, ooh, we've got the distribution ability, we've got the marketing budget, we can take it further down, we'll grow the business, you've done a great job, thanks very much, we'd love to acquire you. This permeates everything I do in the startup world, is this kind of segmentation. If you want to change buying habits, and if that means somebody wants to, you want somebody to buy your stuff where they were buying something else, it's hard to do. So look for fundamental motivators. Pain, for example, is very motivating. Fear, greed, vanity. But virtue, take, the, take these vitamins because that's a tough sell. So what was I really selling with Regain? And what was I really selling with Nightbite? With Regain, I was saying, if you take this, all these biomarkers are going to improve. That's virtue. With night bite, I was saying, you won't die in your sleep. So fear, pain. People would call us up and say, how, how, I took it last night. How do I know it worked? And I, we'd say, well, did you wake up dead? <laughs> no, it worked. <laughs> I noticed the number of hands went up from Sloan School. And I know that some of you in here are mar marketers. And there are all sorts of courses on multivariable factorial analysis, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to tell you the heart of the matter in two bullet points. Find out what your customer wants and give it to them. The other things are all very useful ways of getting to this. But if you do all those and don't do these, you will fail. I had a boss that said this to me, and I never forgave him for it because I couldn't get it out of my head. He called me in his office. Jones, God damn it, there is no hocus pocus that takes the place of focus. I think, oh, make him stop. <laughs> but it was true. And it's very hard. Entrepreneurs all have attention deficit disorder. <gasps> is that a butterfly? So, focus. So, you're not promoting your product or your service, you're finding your customer. Because they hire your stuff to do a particular deed. 
And if you do it right, the selling's easy. So talk to them. I think you said that. Talk to them. There's only so much you can get out of your market research reports. Know them. Ask them what they're spending money on now to solve the problem. And there's a little bit of perceptivity required here. Somebody once asked Henry Ford, Henry, did you ever ask your customers what they want? And Henry said, oh, hell, if I'd asked them what they wanted, they'd have said faster horses. It was his genius, of course, to figure out that that's called a car. You do have competition. If they're not spending money now to solve the problem you're tackling, it's not a problem. You like it, but how's your solution better in the eyes of your customer? Okay. If they don't want it, you can't sell it. And it doesn't matter who needs it. What matters is who wants it. And if you can't find them, you can't sell it. And it's about to be showtime for some of you, because this should be an equal opportunity embarrassment program. If you can't communicate your benefits within seconds, you thought a minute was hard, try it in half that, you won't be able to sell it. So let's try it. We have a couple minutes here before the class winds up. Who would like to take the microphone and tell us the benefits to your customers? Tell us about your business in 30 seconds. We need a pitch. Hey, brave soul. I would have buttonholed Ann, but she left. You got one. All right. Come on down front. Is this thing? Thank you, Jake. Come on down front. Hi, everyone. My name is John Chen, and I'm building a lactation technology startup. It's a breast massager for pumping moms to help them reduce pumping time and increase milk production. Well, I know Anne, who was up here, stay put, which is, so she knows I'm not slagging her, but this is the other end of the spectrum from what she did, which was, you didn't say a word about your technology, you, none of that. You just simply said, here's what you've got, here's who it's for, here's the benefit. I love it. Comments from you guys? Thumbs up? Outstanding. Thank you. All right. That, by the way, is a tough act to follow. Who else? How do you make it memorable? Yes, I think that is an omission. If you'd, if you'd done it in 20 seconds instead of 10, I would have given, it, given the name as well. Because if, based on what she said, I think that at least some people in the audience would say, wow, where do I go to hear more? Which is exactly what your 30 second pitch is supposed to do. Where do I go to hear more, right? So. Even a bad ad should include your website address or your phone number, <laughs> or at the very least, your product name. OK, come on. I have a question. You have a question. Um, it better be a good one. Um, <laughs> so sometimes I hear that investors do not like to invest in niche I'm sorry, say again. Investors do not like to invest in niche applications. And you're basically saying that focus on something very niche. So I recently just heard about it. Make it social, make a social impact, make it powerful. What if you're just selling one? Okay, product? I'm going to take a second and address that because it is a good question. Did you guys all hear it? Should I recap it? We're told re regularly that investors want really gigantic markets, right? And I'm up here saying niche. So how does that work? And the answer is you've got to start someplace, but you don't have to stop there. So I'm starting with athletes with my product for sleep, but then I'm moving to business travelers, and then I'm moving to soldiers, and then I'm, uh, right, but I can find the athletes, they're not price sensitive, they're gonna pay me money, I'm gonna build traction, I'm gonna cover my overhead. I'll be able to look those investors in the eye and say, I don't actually need your money, because I've covered my overhead. It's a platform, it's a launch pad, okay? But we digress. Who else would like to come down and give us a 
a rundown of their business. Good. Come on. So uh, we're the founder of Play Poppers. Uh, what we do is, uh, in today's world, uh, kids, they need to go somewhere to find a place to play. What we're going to get is, at your home, in your parking lots, we're going to pop up a play area, a fun zone for them. That's, uh, that's what we do. And uh, we've been uh, trying to have some different obstacle courses and different courses that uh, children can do apart from uh, just uh, you know, playing video games. We are kind of changing the way children spend their pastime. Good. Stand by for a minute. So we've got a lot of collective wisdom in this room. I, I don't think we, we owe this man kindness, but we owe him respect. So let's respectfully offer a little feedback. Go ahead. Uh, congratulations. What I really like is how you close your, your, your speech. That we are going to change the rules of the game. That's for me. Okay. That's a good piece of feedback. Yes, sir. Said differently, what's broke that you actually, what needs to be fixed that you're fixing? Why are you changing the rules of the game? Your answer to that, thank you. Your answer to that would be that we see a lot of parents complaining about, you know, children getting, like, obesity is one of America's big problem. So I'm trying to take that away, trying to give them uh, more freedom of space and, uh, you know, getting those team building activities right from their childhood. Would one of you like to redo this man's pitch? OK, I will. Well, I'm looking at the clock up there. We don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, pediatric obesity is exploding. The kids that are growing up now are the first generation that's probably going to have a shorter lifespan than their parents because of the whole cascade of consequences that come from kids being fat at an early age and staying fat for their whole life. And one of the major reasons for that is because they are not playing outside. The only thing they're exercising is their thumbs. And we have a solution for that with a pop-up play space that will change the rules of that game, get kids engaged in being physically active, and we'll address a whole bigger problem while we're at it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, one more, and then we'll wrap this baby up. Tuesday night next week, when we talk about presenting your venture, be prepared, because there are going to be a lot of you talking about your business. Go ahead, sir. So I want you all to imagine yourself walking into a tertiary care hospital in a low resource setting where you see 50 beds lined up and only two nurses and you're giving a breathing bag and you're asked to manually ventilate your child until they can find him a ventilator. We built a device that can provide continuous air and ventilation to that patient until they can find a ventilator. This allows them to live longer, breathe longer, be with the relatives. Okay. Comments? Feedback for this man? Did you understand what his business was about? Not really. Okay, we got a not really out of that. So somebody didn't connect the dots. I bet he's not the only one. Yes, sir, were you going to say something? You buy the hospital, the medical officer of the hospital buys it directly from a vendor. Okay, well, we won't have time right now to debate all of that, but I think it, w it was an omission in, in his little 30 second presentation. Thanks very much. Have a seat. I'm going to skip all this because it's much less important than what you're doing. Final questions.
There are people out there who listen to influencers. In the athletic world where I'm working right now, they listen to strength and conditioning coaches, they listen to Tom Brady, whatever, right? Can I find them and can I influence the influencers? All right, also, who's gonna be my first customer and I'd like to know exactly what that person looks like. How do I know they're gonna pay for it? Where will they buy it? And it takes a particularly perverse mind to enjoy sales. I'm one of them. But if you don't have somebody on your team that's gonna go out there and do that, guess what? If you ever hear somebody on your team say, we don't need to market it, this is gonna sell itself, put that under famous last words. Well, you had your shot. Let me summarize. You need one thing and only one thing that's non-negotiable in order to have a business, and I hope it won't surprise you, that's customers. If your business is gonna succeed, you gotta provide something that's important and unique to someone, to someone. Therefore, actually, let me interrupt myself for a second. Usually I stay after for a while with these classes because they're are misguided people who want to come talk. And it's always fun. And I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to catch a really early flight. So I'm only gonna stay for just a couple minutes tonight. I still gotta pack. I'm playing a black tie gig in Kansas Thursday night. And, but I'll be back next week and I will have no such restrictions. So if you do wanna talk and I miss you tonight, I'll be here next week. Okay, so figure out who can't live without what you've got. Find them. Tell them about it. Take their money. Thank you very much. Yeah.